open your Bibles to Joshua, if you have your Bible with you, and um, we're going to the seventh chapter today. Just to give you a little bit of background, Israel has been involved in the greatest military conquest in their history. They have just witnessed a tremendous defeat of the city of Jericho. And they're still basking in the glow of that defeat. But verse 1 tells us of chapter 7 that God is not very happy with the people. So listen carefully to what God says to us today. God is not very happy with the people. And he has a reason for that. Now Israel thought everything was all right. They thought this is going to be a piece of cake. We've come into this territory... God is giving us all the land. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. There's nothing that we're going to desire that God doesn't provide. So we've got it made. Now, I find that Israel is very much like unto, listen carefully, I'm not seeing many eyes, because I want to get your attention for a moment, if you will. Thank you so very much. Listen, I liken them to a lot of churches. And here's the problem. Looks good. Everything's fine. We've got enough people to handle the bills and things are being taken care of and somebody gets saved now and then and a life gets changed and things are going well. And all we have to do is just go to church and sit back and let God do something for us when God's going to do it and leave it all to Him. We don't have a whole lot more to do. We've come into the land of plenty We've come into this land that flows with milk and honey. God is in charge. We just leave it to him. And so we'll just do whatever. And we'll just come to church and and just enjoy being in church. When God has more for us than that, because Israel thought everything was all right. You see, but there was a problem. And what they didn't know was there was someone in the community that had sinned greatly. Somebody in that family had sinned terribly. There was one in their midst who was causing trouble for the entire family of God. And I just want to say this, that what you do in your life and what you do in this church and what you do in in interacting with people in this church greatly affects the entire ministry. Now I want you to put a smile on your face now that I've said that. All right, this is not a downer this morning. This is going to pick us up and lift us up and take us into God's glory. <clears throat> but what we do really counts. How we treat one another, the way we speak to one another, the way we handle the needs of, of, of others is so vitally important. And I want you to see that as we go along this morning. But I want to tell you about Aiken. You've heard about the achy, breaky heart. Well, here's an aching heart. (laughs) Because there was somebody in the camp that really had done wrong, and it was aching, and we're going to discover that. Now, what I've been doing is reading the entire passage for you, and I want to do that this morning. About 26 verses. We'll go through it quickly if we can here, but follow along in your Bible. It's on the screen. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now here's what God had said before I go to verse 2. Here's what God had said. God had said this, as you go into the land and as you conquer city after city, Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take all of the spoil and I want you to gather all of that up and I want you to put it into my chambers. I want you to set it apart for me. I want you to save everything for me. You see, there was a temple that had to be built. There was a building of the temple and they needed the gold and they needed the the different metals and they needed the linens and they needed all of those things. Take all the spoils and put them into a place where they'll be set aside 
for me. I want you to consecrate every piece that you pick up. And so as you go in, do that. Well, here's what we, just, here, here, here's what we discovered. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. We know there was a problem, and now they're going out to the next conquest, the next little battle. Now remember, <clears throat> one of the things that I've always remembered is a saying by <clears throat> a gentleman that worked for Billy Graham, and he said this. He said, you may win the battle, but you might lose the war. And I want you to think about that as we go along. Here they're moving to a second battle. They're going to Ai. Well, looking at Ai, Jericho was a fortified city. Oh my, how were they going to get in there? But Ai, just a small group of people up there. Small band of people, and they're going to go there, and they're going to defeat this, these people easily. That's the next city, the next town. So, Joshua sent out men from Jericho to Ai, <clears throat> which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said, Don't let all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Don't worry all the people about going there. For the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and they struck them down on the descent Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Now they began to get scared. Now they began to be shaken up just a little bit. Joshua tore his clothes and he fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. This is a sign of mourning. <clears throat> Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan to all? to deliver us into the land of the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Oh, that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. You ever feel that way? You're going along in life and someone comes to you and says, listen, you need to receive the Lord as your Savior. And you do. And you bow your knee before Him, you confess your sin, you receive Him as your personal Savior, and life starts getting tough. It does. It's not easy when you're a Christian. I know there are a lot of people who would try to tell you different, and they want you to think that, you know, it's just a piece of cake. You just come to Jesus and everything's wonderful. Well, it is wonderful. You do have a hope, you have a help, but sometimes it's difficult. It's not an easy road. And when we are walking this life, we need God's presence with us and His power and his conquering ability to defeat Satan moment by moment. So <clears throat> you get to thinking, man, sometimes I think it might have been a little better when I was back there with the crowd. You know why? Because Satan was not bothering you. He was leaving you alone because he already had you. Now you belong to the Lord Jesus. Now the battle begins. Now you have become a Christian soldier. That's what you've become. And one of the things that we need to do when people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and you're leading them to Christ, you need to tell them, listen, tomorrow morning when you wake up, you're going to think, well, nothing really happened. I just said a prayer. Satan's going to attack you immediately and he's not going to let up and he's going to stay on you. And that's exactly what he does. Oh, that we had just been content just to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Why do we even bother coming in here? <clears throat> For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it. Now this word's going to sound. And cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? 
He's looking to God and saying, God, what are you going to do for your great name now? What are you going to do? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you laying on your face? Get up. Let's talk. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. I told them I wanted everything taken up and put in a place for me. Everything is to be set aside for me. Listen, everything in your life is to be set aside for God. And if it's not, if you're keeping some to yourself, God is not pleased. Let's look at this situation. <clears throat> For they have taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be any more with you unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Well, it's pretty powerful. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, I shall be brought according to your tribes. You bring them out according to their tribes. It shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to, the, to families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come according to, by households. And the household which the Lord's take shall come man by man. <clears throat> then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done this disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning, brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah. And he brought the family of the Zerites, man by man. And Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household, man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, and the son of Zerah, <clears throat> the son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me what you have done. Do not hide this from me. And Achan answered Joshua, I indeed have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I wanted them and I took them. And they there, and there they are hidden in the earth. In the middle of my tent you'll find them, and you'll find the silver under it. <clears throat> so Joshua sent the messengers out, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Joshua took all of Israel with him, took Achan, the sons of Zerah, and the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkey, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? See, the word Achor means something. It means trouble. The word achor means trouble. Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Trouble to this day. Still is the Valley of Achor. And achor means trouble. There was trouble there. So we see a number of things, and it's very, very important for us to <clears throat> look at the trouble that Israel had. Because you remember, they just came from Jericho, and you remember the great victory they had? God was taking down walls and letting them run in and conquer the land and, and take everything, take all the spoils, do all that there was that God told them to do with ease, no problems, no issues, no problems, no troubles, but there was an Achan. And sometimes in our lives, there's an Achan from time to time. Spell it correctly. You'll know what I mean. But the verse tells us that God has a prescription for an Achan heart. Let's look at that right now. Number one, Israel suffered a terrible defeat. This is the reason I say to you that I strongly believe that this speaks of our life here on this earth 
and not crossing the Jordan and getting into heaven. When we get to heaven, none of that will take place. <clears throat> none of those things will happen. There will be no thieves there. There will be no one who takes things for themselves and steals God's things. There will be no one doing that. None of those things will happen. So that will be heaven. But they suffered a terrible defeat. Now I want you to look at them. The defeat was awful. They didn't know it was coming. They thought God was with them, but they made some mistakes. And I want you to look at what they did. They were a confident people. They said, hey, look what we can do. Why? We have God on our side. We can do anything we need to do. And they went up there. The walls fell down. We just, now, let's go get AI. Wait a minute. God still walks with us. Listen carefully. God doesn't just take you to the next battle. God walks with you step by step, moment by moment. God's plan for your life is not just for this battle and that battle and that battle. He'll be with you. God is with you every moment of every day, every step of your life, and you will walk with the Lord or suffer. A lot of times Christians go through all kinds of difficulties and struggles and problems, and I sit down and I talk with them and I understand. The problem is not with what's going on in the life. The problem is how they're perceiving it. The problem is how we look at it. If we look at the troubles of life and the problems of life and the achens of life, if you will, if we look at those kind of things going on and we say, this is one more step. God is still with me. God will never fail me. I know that I've suffered a defeat here. There's been a problem. But you know what? I know there's great victory ahead. Someone said to me last night, I may not see a whole lot of victory right here on this earth, but I know that God has victory for me. I know. I'm just paraphrasing what he said. So God always has victory for you. God's going to see to it that you are victorious. We've been talking about that. But he wants you to walk with him. It's a step-by-step -step walk. They were so confident. We have it all together. We don't need the Lord. And sometimes we do that as a church. And the reason we do it as a church is because we're doing it as individuals. You do it as a family. Things are looking good right now. We don't need to read our Bible. We don't need to pray. We don't need to talk to God. We don't need to have our confidence in Him. We don't need any of that because God's for us and who can be against us? Isn't this wonderful? Yes, but God wants your attention. God wants you to get up in the morning and recognize He's there. God wants you to read, your, read, read the Word. God wants you to eat the food that He has for you, spiritual food. God has things for you, and you must walk with him step by step by step. Time was after a great spiritual victory. That's a dangerous time for Christians. Wow, things are going great. You know, I notice even in the church family, <clears throat> there are times when we have services and everything's going so wonderful, and people just kind of look, oh yeah, God's blessing, isn't this great? And then all of a sudden, bang, 20 people show up. Finances are low. Problems are there. And sometimes I think we really get too confident. My dad used to say we get a little cocky. <laughs> and he warned me about that. Don't be that way. But after a great victory, it's a dangerous time. Because we say, well, it's all good. It's all good. I don't need. Yes, you do need. Israel was a conquered people. They went into Ai. And I want you to think about how they went there. They said, well, let's see. <clears throat> let's put a committee together and decide what we need to do. So a few of them got together and said, well, you know, we don't need to trouble everybody with this. That's a little, little place up there. We'll go up there and we'll defeat them. So they began to make their decisions as to what they ought to do. I find no place here where they got on their knees before God and said, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for the conquest we just had. Thank you for Jericho. Thank you for taking the walls down. Thank you. Now, Lord, we're here and we're asking you, what will be our next step? There's no place where they did that. They said, well, here we are. We're on a roll. Let's get going. Listen, we don't need a whole big group of guys. Why bother with that? Just send a few thousand in there. That'll be good. And, uh, you know, they'll go up and defeat them. They began to make their own plans. You get a picture here? Who's running your life? Who's in charge? Are you making the plans? 
one of the things that I often say is that we so often say, God, this is what I'm going to do and this is where I'm going and this is how I'm going to live my life. Come on along. I want you to help me because there are going to be times when I'm going to need you. So stay close, dear God. Don't go far away. Instead, we ought to be on our knees every day saying, dear God, what would you have me do today? I don't know what you have for me, but I know what you have for me today because you're leading me step by step by step. So I'm going to step out into this world and I'm going to follow you. But you see, they were conquered. Doesn't have a hint that they sought the will of God for Ai. The scripture doesn't have one hint that they ever did it. They didn't even bother to pray about the matter. You know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing people going, ooh. Oh, you know why? I'll tell you why. Because you're guilty. <clears throat> you're guilty. And so am I. I don't point fingers at you because I'm guilty too. You know how many times I've stepped, well, no, of course you don't, but <laughs> God knows how many times I've stepped out in life and didn't consider the will of God. You say, well, wait a minute, you're a preacher. You don't, yes, I do. I make the same mistakes you make. I'm just as fallible as you are. And I've made those mistakes. And I say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. The scripture tells us, be careful what you say. Be careful what you say about tomorrow. Remember the scripture? Be careful what you say about tomorrow. Because you don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what tomorrow brings. I only have now. And I want to walk in the sunshine of God. In the sun, S-O-N, shine of God. I want to walk with Jesus now. I don't have this afternoon. I don't have this evening. I don't have tomorrow. God knows about that. I only have this moment. Where am I? What do I want to be doing? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I want to, on Sunday mornings, be in the house of God. Where God is, I want to be worshiping with God's people. I want to be fellowshipping with you. And during the week, I want to be used of God in God's way to accomplish His work and His will wherever He sends me every day. And that ought to be your prayer and mine. And sometimes I say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this. Listen, let's be careful of that. There's, there's a blatant example here. They went up there and suffered terrible defeats. Terrible defeats. Why? Because they laid their own plans. People often say, what shall we do in this church? <clears throat> well, I wonder sometimes when I get together with people and they start, well, we ought to do this, we ought to do that, and we ought to do this, we ought to do that. And I wonder, no, we shouldn't do this because that's not even scriptural, number one. Why are you saying we ought to do that? God says that's not what we ought to do. They don't understand it. And sometimes I want to say, but have you prayed about this? Have you thought that's the thing to do? We don't do things by prayer. We don't do things by talking with God. We don't look to Him for His direction and His leading. We fail miserably when it comes to that. And yet we're making plans. I'm not talking about making plans to have a movie night. I'm not talking about making plans to do things like that. That's the fellowship of the church. But I'm talking about where God is going to lead us and how He's going to take us there. We don't seek God. Where's the prayer in the church? Who's praying for this church? Some of you are saying right now, Pastor, I pray. <clears throat> I pray. Some of you are saying now, I enter into my closet and I pray every day. I pray for you. I pray for the church. I pray for God leading. And I know you do. And I know there are some who do that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us did that? What power? What would God do with us? if every single one of us spent time in prayer seeking God's will, not only for our life, but for our family, and then for our church family, and for our church. Lord, what would you have us to do? We're so good at making plans. And I know I'm laboring this point, but don't make your plans without talking to God. <clears throat> Shall I say it again? Don't make your plans without talking to God. People say to me, I don't know where I'm going to work. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to share something with you. <clears throat> and
and I'm going to share this with you. I hesitate a little bit, but I want to tell you something that's important to me. It's about God's working in my life. One time in my life, I went looking for work. So if you want to know how to go look for work, I can't help you. <clears throat> I don't know how to go out and look for work. Because I never went out and looked for work. One time, I got out of the service, and I needed a job. And I was in Lima. So I took a job in a dairy, and I started loading trucks, semi-trucks. I was a little guy, and I was loading a whole semi-truck every night. Oh, and I got tired. That's work with milk. You know what milk weighs? <laughs> Do you know when you stack them eight high? Anyhow, in a truck, and grab them by a hook and drag them 52 feet down to the front and rock them with your foot and put them in position? I'd load a whole truck. Then they said, hey, why don't you come inside and start running one of the machines and bottle the milk in here? I said, I'll do anything to get off that dock. It was cold in Lima, <clears throat> just like here. And there I was. So I went inside and began to work inside. And then a neighbor came to me. And the neighbor lived down the street that was my insurance agent. He said, we're looking for agents. Would you be interested in going to get some schooling and sell insurance. I said, you know, it sounds a whole lot better than what I'm doing right now. So I went to work with Western Southern, and I sold insurance with Western Southern. And then God came to me and said, you've got to drop everything. Well, then, no, Mr. Mr. Tam came to me and said, hey, would you like a job in my company? I need, some, I need a manager of my offices and things. I need somebody to run things. We're growing. Would you come and work for me? And I did for three years. Then God said, okay, you're leaving all this and going to school. I've never gone looking for a church one time. I've never sought out a church. I've never sought a job. And I'll tell you why. Because this. Every morning when I get up, and please, I hesitated telling you this. I'm serious. I hesitated telling you this. And I'll tell you why. Because <clears throat> people might think, Boy, he just thinks he's so good. No, that's not has nothing to do with that. It's all to do with him. Listen carefully. It's not me. It's him. Listen carefully. God has led my life and directed my life and put me from this place to this place to this place. I never said I want to leave this church and go to another church, ever. I said I'm going to serve till God moves me. And when God moved, he directed me somewhere else. Now, why do I tell you that? Because I know how God can work in your life. You worry about tomorrow. You worry about the job. You worry about what you're going to do. You worry about all these things. We get frantic about these things. You worry about your family. You worry about this. And the Bible says, fret not. God is clear on that subject. He says, stop worrying about tomorrow. For tomorrow has enough trouble already, but it will take care of itself. See? And that's what we do. I'm trying to encourage you today. I only told you that for that reason, to encourage you. Listen carefully. God leads His children. Come on, somebody say amen to that, will you? Has anybody else experienced that but me? Say amen. God leads His children. And when you're open to His will and His way and His place and His time and all of those things, <clears throat> and you sit back and you say, Listen, God, Boy, I sure wish something would have happened by now. But you know what? You're going to see the hand of the Lord care for you until God takes care of what he has to take care of. And he'll lead you and guide you. They didn't take the Ark of the Covenant into the battle. There's nothing in this passage that tells us they took the Ark of the Covenant into the battle. They just sent some guys up there and they went up and they were going to conquer. Why is it important to take the Ark of the Covenant? Come on. Pardon? Okay, the power. What is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God. Remember the presence of God resided in the Ark. So what did they do as they marched around Jericho? Where was the Ark? You remember? God was leading them. Yeah. God was with them. 
the power of God. And they just set the ark down somewhere and said, hey, let's go up and take this next one. Uh Uh-uh. God says, no, 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 no. You're not going to do this without me. Why do you think you're going to go up there and conquer without me? And I can tell you this, that God says that to you too and to me. Why do you think you're going to win victory without me? Why do you think you're going to be victorious without me? No, no. You take me with you. You say, well, it's different now because the Holy Spirit lives within us, so wherever we are. Yeah, but if he's living in here and you're not even recognizing that he's there, you didn't even say good morning to him today, you haven't talked to him since Sunday when collectively we got together and it's Friday and he's trying to lead you and he's trying to get your attention and he's trying to help you and you're not paying any attention. Come on, church. That's what it's all about. They didn't take the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't take God with them. They went off on their own to do their own thing to conquer. And I'm here to tell you that what the Bible says, what Jesus Christ says, is so true. And the truth, listen carefully, is what sets you free. Jesus said these words. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Are you hearing it? Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Yeah. Are you getting the message here this morning? You see what this says to us? Do you see why this Old Testament teaching is so very, very important? Because we bring it into this. Israel had their confidence in their own power and not in the Lord. And when we do that, oh, we ended up confounded. They were a confounded people. They said, oh no, people are dying. They're coming after us. They're going to kill 30 some of our men now. And they were fleeing. Notice it says down the hill. They were running down the hill away from those people of Ai. Oh, they were pretty good sized people. Remember when they went in and spied out, they said some of these people are like giants, we're like grasshoppers. These people of Ai are large people. And there they were running from them. So they suffered a painful defeat. But they also made a painful discovery. I mean, they had to discover it. Because God said, there's a problem in your camp. It needs to be dealt with. So, Joshua reacts in prayer. He gets on his face before God. And he says, God, I'm lying here with dirt on my head. He literally took dirt and pulled it up over his head. That was a sign of mourning. That was a sign of total defeat. It was a sign of being open before God and listening to God, saying, I am nothing but dust and you are everything. It was something that they did when they went into battle at times before God. And he said something had to be dealt with. So God began to rehearse the problem. He said, there's someone in your camp that has broken my covenant. There's someone in your church, there's someone in your group, there's someone with your people that broke the covenant and it has to be dealt with. And if it isn't dealt with, then you're not going to find victory. It's kind of interesting. God in heaven already knows, and he tells Joshua all about it. It's interesting that God knows everything, isn't it? See, we can't hide anything from God. That's something I had to learn. For a long time in my life, I thought, well, I can be good at hiding this from people and that from people. Nobody will know this. Listen, you can't run from God and you can't hide things from God. God knows the very, and here I go again because I've said this a thousand times probably in this church in 16 years, maybe not that many, but close. God knows the very thought and intent of our heart. So obviously, if he knows the thought and intent of our heart, he certainly knows the deeds. And he said, there's a problem. Seven observations I want to give to you that affect our lives. Number one, God knows everything about you. He knows about your sin. He knows about everything. He knows about the good things, too. Number two, verse 11 says, God hates our sin. So does Proverbs chapter 6. Number three, God has a plan for our life. God has a plan for our sins, for every single one. 1 John 1, 9 says what? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us. The word cleanse there, <clears throat> I don't want this to be dry, shredded wheat. You need a seventh inning stretch. You want to stand? You want to shake it off a little bit, a little bit here? Listen, here's, here's what it says. God continues to cleanse and cleanse and cleanse and cleanse and cleanse. That's what that verse reads in the original Greek. Because when you says he, when, when you see there, he cleanses from all sins, it's a Greek word that means wash it and 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 wash it. Isn't that wonderful? Leave it in the water. Keep washing it. Keep washing it. Keep cleaning it. Keep cleaning it. Keep scrubbing it. God keeps it clean. He continues to cleanse from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Look at 1 John and you'll discover that that's not written to sinners who need to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. That's written to the church. 1 John is written to my brethren. He's called John the Beloved. Somebody asked me last night who he was. John. John's the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. Now he's writing back here and he says, My Beloved. You look at chapter 2 and it says, My brethren, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father who's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That's the first verse of chapter 2. So look at that passage in 1 John and it says if we confess our sins, he's not talking to people who don't know God. He's talking to people who are God's family. He's talking to the people in the church. He's talking to the children of God when he says if we confess our sins. <clears throat> when was the last time you sinned? Oh, I don't want anybody speaking up, please. Don't need any confessions because that's done to God. But when was the last time you sinned? You say, oh, well, um, mm, uh, let's see. Most of us probably don't have to go, mm, let's see. We probably can tell, right? If we confess our sins, you see, as Christians, we do that. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Lord, I didn't trust you for this. Lord, I didn't talk to you about this. Lord, I didn't let you in my life here. Lord, I didn't ask for your direction. Lord, I didn't do this. Now, I want you to forgive me. And I believe some of us need to go before God and say, God, I have not been asking direction for your life. Do you know that God has been leading some people in this church to do that already? Some people have been to this altar and some people have done it at home. They've told me about it. God's changing some people's lives just by this study. And the reason is they're seeing that they're not letting God have control. Isn't that wonderful? Nothing thrills this pastor more. Well, it's great because God isn't in control. So what we do is <clears throat> God hates our sin. He has a plan for us. And that is to cleanse us. Us, the saved ones. Nice to be clean. I'm not going to ask who took a shower this morning. Most of you probably washed your face anyhow and combed your hair. <laughs> you cleaned up a little bit before coming to church because you have to do that often. And you know what? I have to go before my Lord many, many, many times every day. Every day of my life. I do. And sometimes I have to ask Him forgiveness. And His Spirit makes things aware because I want to be walking in God's plan. God's going to punish the sin. But see, here's the thing. God will punish the sin. He punished Achan's. And look how many people he took with him. Don't question that. It's not ours to question. The way God worked in that day works different now because of grace. But I'll tell you this. God punished the sin. But I'm so thankful that he's not punishing mine anymore. Woo! This is tough for you, I know. Say, oh, what are you talking about? Because he gives me an opportunity. Oh, he will if I don't confess it. He'll bring me to a place. But you know what? Jesus took my punishment on the cross. Come on, church. Get it in your heart. Get it in your mind. Jesus took my punishment on the cross. He sits by the Father 
advocating for me. And he is saying to the Father, but he's mine. He's ours. I've forgiven him, Lord. I've forgiven him. And I can walk in forgiveness knowing that Jesus took my punishment. And he still takes it every day. All I have to do is go to him and say, forgive me, Lord. And it's that simple. If I mean that from my heart, this is not an easy thing for us to do because it's hard for us to, to confess our sins. It is. It's hard for us to say I was wrong. It's hard for us to confess. Some people will never tell you they're wrong. Some people don't ever go to God. Some people stay away from God because of pride. Pride was the first sin ever in Scripture recorded. Pride. It was. Why do you think sin came into the world? Because Satan went to Eve and said, Did God say that? Are you serious? Is that what God told you? Why? He knows good from evil and you don't. You only know good. You don't have it all. Don't you want it all? Yeah. She said, hmm, is that right? You mean God's withholding something from us? He says, yep, he sure is. That's all part of what happened in the Garden of Eden. So with a heart filled with pride, she said, I want to know more. Stepped out into sin. God will take away our sin. And another thing to remember, look at this passage again. Sin affects those around us. Sin affects those around us. Now Israel went into battle and they didn't know why they were being defeated, did they? They didn't know why. Those guys didn't know. They're just going up, yeah, this is what Joshua told us to do, so we're going up. Our leader said, this is what we're going to do. Take a little band, go up there, and whoa, they're running away. Some of them are dying. Being killed. Why? Because sin affects those around us. Terribly. You know what? We're all one body here. We talk about it. We talk about how close we are and how we love each other. And we do. I believe it. We're a very warm and friendly and loving church. But you know what? What I do affects you. And what you do affects me. I wish I'd get an amen on that. Because <clears throat> it's true. It's true. What we do. Well, sin hinders God's work. Verse 12 bears it out. They were defeated. And sometimes we're defeated because of sin. And seven, sin has to be dealt with. You see, either you're going to deal with it or God's going to deal with it. Anyway, it's going to be handled one way or another. So they received a painful defeat. They discovered something that was painful to them. And there was a painful death. Achan's death. And all of his family. That's not pleasant to read in Scripture. The sinner was discovered. The sin was discussed. God discussed it with the leader. And he said something has to be done. There was compassion. There was confession. Note the progression of sin. He said, I saw it. I wanted it. I coveted it. And I took it. That's what he did. But the sinner was destroyed. I'm thankful that in this day God doesn't deal with us that way, aren't you? Come on, put a smile on your face. This is more of a happy time because God doesn't deal that way now. God put it on Jesus. He bore all of our sin. By his stripes we're freed. By his stripes we're healed from our sin sickness. By his stripes we're set free. Jesus bore the pain. Jesus bore the suffering. Jesus bore the hurt. Jesus bore the agony. Why? For you and me. He did it. But the sin was destroyed. And the sinner in that day. The name of the valley is called Acre. I told you earlier, it means trouble, because that's exactly what it is. And if you're going to sin, according to Proverbs 13, 15, you're headed for trouble. Sometimes as Christians, we know something's wrong, but we say, ah, we'll do it anyhow. You know what I'm talking about, we just do. Hosea, 
Chapter 2 and verse 15 says this. I will give her her vineyards from thence, from now on, and the valley of Acre for a door of hope. And she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. This was not a defeat for long. Oh, it was at first, but guess what? They conquered. God took control. They went in and they conquered Ai. They took the city just as God wanted them to do. What was their problem? They hadn't asked him, hadn't talked to him, hadn't taken him with them, wasn't interested in doing it God's way, did it their own. Oh, what a lesson for us. Huh? You see it? You see the parallel? So what are you doing with your life? You know what? I get a lot of people looking at me when I preach this. They go, mm, boy, whoa, whoa, this is bad. Take that off your face. <clears throat> Put the smile on your face. Jesus has done it all for you. But the truth is, Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. He, he gave it all. Isn't that wonderful? Now, my past sin is forgiven. Stop worrying about your past sin. It's done. It's over. It's forgiven. The Bible says he'll remember it no more, which means he'll never call it back up to you ever, ever again. Isn't that wonderful truth? So, what's ahead for us? Victory. There's victory in Jesus. I shouldn't be singing. Victory in Jesus, okay? God knows all about it. Your painful defeat doesn't have to remain painful. When you look at the cross and you see what Jesus did for you, Oh, you agonize a little bit because of what he went through. But then you begin to realize when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He did it all for me. Let's stand, please. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for taking my place there in the place of every one of us here. Thank you for giving yourself for us that we might have redemption, that we might be bought out of that slave market of sin and brought back into the presence of God as we were originally created. I thank you, Jesus, that you paid all the price and satisfied the Heavenly Father by giving your life for our sin. Lord, take our lives, have your way in them. Use us for your glory. And Lord, by that, we mean get glory to yourself. Lead us. Guide us. And use us, Father, to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ. Let us not look at this AI situation as a defeat, but as a great victory. Because you taught them lessons. You showed them how from here on when they go in to conquer the land and they go in to take other places as you send them. <clears throat> the Lord, if they do it in your way and in your will and in your presence, it's all going to be fine. Teach us the same thing. Help us to understand that though we're going through tough times right now, your presence is what's important. And we pray, dear Father, that you'll be with us in every circumstance of life and we'll recognize your presence. Give us the victories as we look to you. Now, Lord, we want to remember Tim as he goes tomorrow morning for this time of surgery. We ask, dear Jesus, that everything will be done perfectly well. Lord, that everyone who works with him will do everything that needs to be done according to how it's to be done. And, Father, that he will come through this easily, that he will heal quickly, and, Lord, that he'll be able to give you glory and praise for what you're doing in his life. So we pray for him and lift him up now and ask your help and blessing. Be with his family. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Take away fears. Let them confidently put him in your loving care. So, Lord, we give them all to you, and we ask your help and blessing. Bless each one in this place. Bless those who couldn't be here. Bless those who are sick in body and going through difficult times. We commit them unto you. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for the victories we receive. Lord, help us to confess 
our sins to you, to let you have your way in our life, and to continue to grow in your spirit. Dismiss us with your blessing. Make us a blessing to others. May Christ be glorified here. In your precious name we pray. Amen.